So where we left off last time was the different types of uh, muscles based off, basically we're detailing the muscle cell and we looked at the different types based off mitochondrial <coughs> density. Where I want to pick up this morning is to take a look at the protein that is present inside of the cell. So we've talked about the nucleus, we've talked about the uh, mitochondria. Now let's talk about the protein. And that's what you're looking at here are threads of many, many proteins organized together. This structure here is multiple proteins corded together in a single cord of proteins. And there's a very distinct structure that appears from this organization. And that structure, which you can see represented here in two dimensions, is called the sarcomere. And that sarcomere is present because the cell of the muscle is full of protein structure. So these threads, we're going to call those threads myofibrils. Yeah, it was uh, I was thinking it was different concentrations by the time we were that we have that four. Nice. One was uh, a mystery. <laughs> it probably should be if you want to keep oh gosh okay um because we have that was the mitochondria different concentrations of mitochondria yeah. you can call this or and we'll have to keep you on target here it's okay um so it's full protein structure, we're going to call those myofibrils, and those myofibrils consist of two particular proteins that we really want to know a lot about. Those two proteins are actin and myosin. Everybody all right? One number, and it's like I killed your dog up here. <laughs> we ran over him twice. So, actin and myosin are the two proteins, the specific proteins that we find organized into the, the myofibril. So, if I were to, and you can see this here at the very base of this particular uh, figure, that, that would be the uh, cross section through one of these myofibrils. And hopefully you can see small little dots in there. Those dots are going to be minus. You're also going to have active embedded there as well. You can see that here represented in sort of a bluish color. So here is our active. From, from this figure here, we're, we're basically going from this three-dimensional look, and we are extracting just one portion of it, this part right here, and we're putting it into two-dimensional terms. And the reason that we're doing this is because this becomes the functional unit of muscle contraction. Biosin in the middle and active filaments come here attached to these things called Z discs. Right? So these myofibrils and the way they're organized with actin and myosin. Are going to be responsible for the contractile, the contractile ability of skeletons. So the the kind of global picture here 
our myosin and our actin are going to interact, and basically myosin is going to grab onto actin, and we're going to create a tug of war. And as that myosin molecule pulls on the actin, these structures here called the Z discs are going to get closer together. So we're going to shorten this structure. Kind of translate that up here. This this piece of the uh, of the picture is going to get smaller. If you go up to now the whole muscle cell, the whole muscle cell is going to get smaller. If you go up to the whole muscle, the whole muscle gets smaller. And that's contraction. And that's what leads towards the movement on the skeleton. Is everybody sort of following me? This structure here shortens. Relayed up here, the whole thing shortens. Relayed up to here, the whole cell shortens and the whole muscle shortens. So we have to figure out, well, how does it actually short? What happens to make this decrease in its total length? Okay. So I haven't told you the name here yet, but this has a very specific name. I think that's right. The specific name of this structure, which you can see right here, and you can also see it, by the way, right here, right? This is the same as this, just in three dimensions rather than two dimensions. And then this is what you see right up here in this little tiny, little tiny uh, piece of this myofibril. And then these lines here, the striations, that not, that's not just because it's a four screen. Those striations are actually supposed to be there. And those striations are the basically showing that you have lower density protein here, higher density protein here. So this looks a lot darker, this looks a lot lighter. So you get these alternating bands of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, so on and so forth. And we're going to have to basically make those light portions get closer together to cause muscle contraction here or there. So the whole structure from Z disc to Z disc is called a sarcomere. The sarcomere is the unit of contraction. To measure the total distance there in the sarcomere, we use units called nanometers, which a nanometer is to go from a meter, a thousand times smaller as a millimeter. A thousand times smaller than a millimeter is a micrometer. A thousand times smaller than a micrometer is a nanometer. So we're talking about a billion times smaller than a meter is the unit that we would have to use to describe the distance from here over here. So it's really, really, really small, but again, loaded with, it's actually really big in terms of the molecular world, but really small for us. And it's our unit of contraction. It's this unit of contraction where we have basically a section that's low density and so more light passes through so it has a light appearance under microscopy. And then a big dense dark section and then another light section. It's what's responsible to produce those striations altering light dark, light dark, light dark. causes the striated appearance. And I want to start out with the basic anatomy because whenever we start with the basic anatomy, we can then begin to hang physiology off of that, off of that anatomy. So the basic, <coughs> the basic structure for a sarcomere, the, the classic sarcomere definition is from Z line or disc to Z line or Z disc. Okay, so two different terms for the same thing. Z disc and Z line are synonyms. So one sarcomere would be from Z line to Z line. If we go up here, you can see that you have 
one whole sarcomere, and you have a portion of another sarcomere here and a portion of another sarcomere here. If I go up here, I'm basically looking for a light and then a dark and then a light. And so I have light to light with dark in the middle, one sarcomere, two sarcomeres, three sarcomeres, four, five, six, seven, eight sarcomeres shown. And they're all lined up in, in, in these big long chains called myofibers. So these structures here, the Z disks, they have individual proteins that show up there. Right in the middle, the dark band, we call that the A band. <coughs> so this dark portion, and the reason it's dark is just simply because it's how we see it under light microscopy. Not as much light passes through, so it appears to be darker in color. So that dark band is in the middle of our sarcomere. And we refer to that as the A band, because dark has the letter A. So it's dark, dark band or the A band. On either side here, we have these light bands, and half of the light band is going to be incorporated into uh, one sarcomere. So on either side, we have half of the light band. If we were to extend over this way, we would basically take this middle part and we would transcribe it over to here, put it all in a big one long connection. So surrounding the Z disk is the light bands, or are the light bands. These act as the outer edge, outer edges of the uh, sarcomere. And their light, there's an I in the word light, so let's call it I band. So the dark band, A band, the light band, this is I band. So in order to make this contract, I want to bring my I bands closer together. And it's going to be the proteins present in the dark band, the myosin proteins, that grab onto these actin proteins that are connected up to the light band, and they just simply pull on. All right, so let's contract the muscle. So you're looking at the same sarcomere, just in two different ways here. This is what it actually looks like on a micrograph. This is a scanning electron microscope picture. You can see the, the dark band here and see why it's called the dark band. You can see the light band here, and right in the middle, this is the Z-line. So there's my Z-line, my, my uh, light band, my whole dark band, and then on the other side, here's my Z-line and my light band. So this particular picture shows one sarcomere. Z-line to Z-line. For this muscle to contract, I want to take these Z-lines and I want to move them closer together. Is everybody following? So I want to take that Z-line and I want to take those and move those Z-lines closer and closer together. And that shortens the whole length of the sarcomere, translated all the way up to the whole length of the muscle. Up on top, you basically are looking at the same cartoon schematic just in a little bit different form than we were just looking at on our on the last picture. Myosin molecules here in the middle, actin molecules here uh, on the outside attached into our Z lines. Okay, so here's one Z line, here's our other Z line. Myosin molecules and actin molecules. Myosin and actin are going to interact. And basically myosin is just simply going to grab onto the actin. It's going to pull on it. And as it pulls on the actin molecule, the actin molecule pulls that Z-line closer towards the middle of that cycle. So the whole thing is just going to shorten up. All right, so starting with those Z-lines or those Z-discs, they are made up of a bunch of different types of anchored proteins. So these are proteins that hold the actin filaments 
in place while also attaching to things like the cell membrane and then into our fascia, our endomesium. So this is our anchor point. Think of this as being a tug of war, right? You usually put that big, huge fat guy at the very end of the rope, and he just kind of leans back and holds onto the rope, and all the skinny, strong guys do all the work, and he just anchors it so that the rope, or their, their team doesn't move. Everybody, everybody with me? So the Z-line is the big, fat guy who's anchoring the whole structure in that location, and he's holding on to the cell membrane, making sure that if he does move, he pulls the cell membrane with him. So the light band, what we would call the I band, which you can see that represented here, that is where we find actin filaments or our actin chain. Now, in addition to the actin chain, there's also some other molecules that are uh, that are in place, and those are regulatory molecules. I don't want my muscles to contract all the time. I want my muscles to basically contract just when I need them. Uh, so I'm going to put in regulatory molecules that basically prevent myosin's ability to interact with, my, with the actin in the pore. So in the light band, we have the actin, the actin chain with its regulatory molecules. And then in the dark band of the sarcomere, what do we call the dark band? It's also the A band. We have both the uh, actin and myosin. We call the actin the thin filament, and we call the myosin the thick filament. <coughs> so this is just a small filament called the thin filament. This is a thicker filament called the thick filament. The thin filament is made up of actin. So here, think actin. And for the thick filament, think myosin. Actin is the thin filament, myosin is found in the thick film. So in the dark band, here in the middle, you can see that we have both the thin filament and the thick filament present. Okay, so we have these two little sections here where both thick and thin filaments are going to be found. So both actin and myosin. Whereas over here, we just had, just had um, our thin film and our actin. Here we have both. And then in the very middle, you will see that we just have our thick film. Okay, so our thick filament, what, what's the molecule? What's the protein we find here? Myosin. The thick filament, if we get down to the very high resolution molecular level of thick filament, what we would see <coughs> are heads that flex. And I'll try to draw this out here in just a second. When those heads flex, they attach and grab onto actin. Okay? So this is my thick filament here. So I'm just sort of highlighting just one little small region of this whole thing. There are these heads that come off of the myosin molecule. Okay. And really, if I draw, this is a, a chain of many, many myosin molecules. If I draw out an individual myosin, kind of looks like a golf club, where I have the shaft and then I have the head. So a lot of times I'll represent the myosin molecule just with my forearm and my wrist. And the wrist is that point of flexion. The hand is going to be the head. 
So if that wrist flexes, it can grab onto the active molecule. So there's a little hinge here in this molecule that allows the head to flex up and then it can grab onto the actin. Okay, so that would be the actin. The myosin, I'm sorry, that would be, dang it, that would be the, the myosin, the actin, are little globular balls, all strung together in a big long chain. When one of these heads flex, there's a little pocket here where that myosin head actually can attach into. And you have a chemical reaction that occurs in that head between the myosin and the actin. And it's just like reaching out and, and creating a handshake. Grab on and then you can pull that other molecule wherever you want to pull. Okay? So this is our thick filament. This is going to be the thin filament. What's the molecule we find in the thin filament? Actin. So this thin or this actin filament is comprised of those globular proteins all strung together in a long chain. And on each of those globs, you have a little pocket that can accept the head of the myosin molecules. Now, if that head flexes and grabs onto that myosin molecule, this creates that tug of war. The myosin is now going to begin to pull on the actin. Hopefully you're beginning to see what's going to happen. Okay? So if this myosin here grabs onto this actin and begins to pull, what happens to the overall structure of the sarcoma? It's going to begin to shorten. Okay? So myosin grabs on, begins to pull on the actin, and then it releases and it grabs onto another place and pulls on the actin, and as that happens, this myosin gets just a yank on the it's kind of like hand over hand as the myosin molecule pulls on that actin molecule. Now, I don't want that to happen all the time, right? If it happened all the time, I would be constantly contracted and I would not be able to survive. So I want to regulate when myosin can grab on to actin. If I just have an actin molecule and a myosin molecule without any of the regulatory molecules, myosin grabs on to actin and causes the sarcoma to be shortened. So it's always, always going to be in a contracted state. So I'm going to add in some regulatory proteins. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to start at the level of the nerve, and we're going to work our way down the cell to those regulatory proteins. And we're going to talk about how we take those regulatory proteins from being in place to separate the myosin from the actin to exposing the actin to the myosin so that contraction can occur. So in order to do that, we have to go back up to the level of the muscle cell. Each of your muscle cells is innervated by a nerve. The whole, um, or the, the nerve itself is called a motor neuron. And really, a nerve is a collection of many, many neurons. The neuron is the cell. The nerve is a bundle of those cells, a bundle of those neurons. I got a picture here to try to help illustrate this. So this is a neuron. This is coming off of a single nerve, and what you're looking at here are multiple cells. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 muscle cells. Inside of these cells, those are the myofibrils. And then inside of those myofibrils is where we're going to find the sarcoma. Okay? So this nerve comes in, and you can see that I have attachment to a couple different muscle cells. But notice I don't have attachment to all of the muscle cells. So one neuron attaches to one, two, three, four, looks like we got four different muscle cells that it's attached to. One neuron, four muscle cells. It makes up this thing called a motor unit. Motor unit is the one neuron attached to its 
individual muscle cells. Now, kind of thinking ahead, if I activate this neuron and cause a signal to enter into these muscle cells, all of them are going to contract all at the same time. So it contracts as a unit. That's why we call it motor unit. The connection here between the muscle and the nerve, that connection is called a neuromuscular junction. And why do we call it a neuromuscular junction? Well, it's because it's a, nut, a, a junction or a connection point between a muscle and a nerve or a neuro, neuromuscular junction. If we are to get into the nitty gritty of the neuromuscular junction, this is what one neuromuscular junction is going to look like. Here's a micrograph. Hopefully you can see the muscle fibers. And then this is the neuron that comes down. And you can see that we have these individual little um, ends to the neuron. They're called the terminal button in this particular fit figure. It is synonymous with this structure here. So the neuron comes in, and we have this uh, terminal button structure. I'm going to call that. The, uh, I'm going to call that the synapt synaptic knob of the neuron. And then we end up with this depression in the muscle cell where this synaptic knob kind of fits in. There's still going to be a gap there. So this is all extracellular fluid in here. But this is the neuromuscular junction. You have the muscle side called the motor end plate, and then you have the neuron side called the synaptic knob. So in this neuromuscular junction, we have this tiny little space that forms. And the proper name for that tiny space is the synapse. So we have this tiny little space called the synapse. Now, when I activate that neuron, I send a signal down that neuron, that signal is electrical. That means I actually can use a voltmeter and I can measure the voltage of that particular signal, just like you could on a, on a battery. So I can measure that signal and it's an electrical signal. But I want to convert that electrical signal so that I can contract my muscle. And what kind of what kind of um, work is that muscle when it contracts? Is it electrical work? Is it an electrical signal? Or is it actually mechanical? It's mechanical. So think about this. You got a little toy that maybe you give a kid, let's say it's a little remote control car. The battery is an electrical signal, but the car, when it drives around, is following a mechanical process. So I have to convert the electrical signal of the battery into a mechanical process to drive the car across the floor, right? The same thing has to happen here. We have to take our electrical signal from our nerve fiber, our neuron, and I have to convert it into the mechanical process of muscle contraction. Okay? So those motor neurons, the, the neuron part of it starts off with the electrical signal. And I'm going to take that electrical signal and I'm going to convert it into a mechanical process. In that toy, usually what it is is it's a little battery that holds a difference in, in potential, so voltage. You turn it on and that voltage flows through a circuit and it spins a gear. So the electrical current spins around a uh, servo motor or something like that. Basically, they spin the current in a circle around an axis of a gear, and that gear begins to spin, and it's a mechanical motion. It's more complex here, but the idea is still the same. That motor neuron is going to initially release a chemical that converts back into an electrical signal that leads to another chemical signal that leads towards a mechanical process. And we're going to go through each level in detail there. This process right here, taking that electrical signal, which I call an action potential, and convert it into a chemical signal, 
are centered around a group of molecules called neurotransmitters. It's nice when words actually sort of make sense. Neurotransmitters are going to transmit the neuron signal. So they're going to take that neuron signal and they're going to transmit it across the synapse to the muscle cell. And it does it through a chemical process. And when I mean a chemical process, I mean we're going to release a chemical. You can see these little red dots in here. Those are the chemicals that are released. They're stimulated to release from that neuron. When that signal comes down, that action potential, which is an electrical signal, causes the release of that chemical to create a chemical signal. That chemical is called acetylcholine. And we call that ACH. Now, I know there are several psychology majors in here, and you need to be familiar with neurotransmission. Because most of the stuff that you're studying in psychology is actually due to brain chemistry. And this is brain chemistry right here. You've probably run into some other, and maybe have any of you talked about acetylcholine, any of the psychology majors have talked about acetylcholine, some other neurotransmitters you've maybe run into, serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine. Those are all neurotransmitters as well. It's just a molecule, it's simply a molecule that gets released from the synapse, or from the synaptic knob into the synapse. And it crosses that synapse and begins to interact with these little guys here, which are called receptors. In this case, it's an acetylcholine receptor. So acetylcholine fills up the synapse. And it binds a receptor. Now that receptor, I'm going to give you a hint here, is a protein. I said it before, and I'll say it again. What happens when we bind something to a protein? It changes the shape of the pro protein, which leads to a change in function. Let me give you another example that may, be, uh, um, may help. It's a, an analogous sample. Think about a baseball glove. How do you catch a ball? The glove has to be open, right? Then when the ball hits the glove, which is analogous to the acetylcholine binding to the acetylcholine receptor, what has to happen to the glove? It has to close up. What happens if it closes too early? You can't catch the ball, right? The ball, when it hits the glove, the glove is designed so that interaction is what actually causes the hand to squeeze, right? So the baseball lands in the glove, the glove interacts with the baseball. That's like binding the acetylcholine to the receptor that causes the glove to change its shape. Here, when I bind the acetylcholine to the receptor, it causes the receptor to change its shape. Before the acetylcholine was bound, that receptor was closed. With the acetylcholine, the receptor opens up. So we get a change in physiology in response to that interaction between the neurotransmitter and the neurotransmitter's receptor, in this case, acetylcholine and the acetylcholine receptor. Now, the change in physiology that happens here, and you can see it represented right here in this particular figure, and you probably all can't see this, but acetylcholine causes these acetylcholine receptors to open up, and then they act like ion changes. Ions are charged particles, including sodium and potassium. So sodium and potassium are actually going to begin to enter the cell. OK, so keep that in mind. Now, to get from here down to here, I have to cause the acetylcholine to be released. What is the? nature of my action potential. Is it mechanical? Is it chemical? Is it electrical? Action potential in the neuron. It's electrical. So that electrical impulse travels down the neuron. And it's that electrical impulse that is actually going to be the stimulus
to release my ACH, my acetylcholine. So I'm kind of going back and giving you the whole process again. Here's my action potential. My action potential travels along the neuron, and when it enters into the synapse, really what's happening, and I don't want you to really worry too much about the detail here, but just to give you an idea, that electrical impulse opens up these things called voltage-gated calcium channels. They're voltage-gated because they respond to the voltage that's coming in from the signal, the electrical signal tra traversing down the uh, neuron. Calcium is really, really high outside of the cell. It's really low. That's a concentration gradient. Right? We can talk about concentration gradients a little bit. If I have a high amount of calcium out here, a low amount of calcium here, how is calcium going to travel? From outside the cell into the cell. Right? If we bring more people in here right now, let's say another 100 people join us in the room right now, they're probably going to distribute into places where there's lower number of people. They're not going to come and sit in the labs. Basically, what I'm saying, they're going to take a book the chair because there's lower concentration of humans in that chair. So, calcium rushes into the cell, and it's that increase in calcium through a variety of molecular mechanisms that cause these little vesicles here that contain the acetylcholine. Remember, a vesicle is a cell, is, is a, I'm sorry, is a membrane-bound organelle. It's a little packet. Membrane around this little packet loaded up with the acetylcholine. Calcium enters the cell, and it causes that acetylcholine packet to bind up on the external face here, the, I'm sorry, the, the synaptic face of the uh, synaptic knob. And that vesicle releases the acetylcholine and we begin to increase the acetylcholine concentration here in the synaptic cleft or the synapse. Okay, so that's the simulation of acetylcholine to be released into the synapse. When ACTH levels increase in the synapse, ACH begins to bind to its receptor, the ACH receptor. Now, we find the receptors bound up here in the muscle side of the synapse. So this is the muscle membrane. We're going to call that the motor end plate. So in the membrane of the motor end plate, we have all these little receptors. So the receptor is in the membrane. It's a protein. So when we bind that protein, that receptor, causes that protein to go through a conformational change. We change the shape of the protein. The receptor opens up and acts as a channel for ions. So sodium and potassium begin to exchange across the membrane. I turn the battery on for the muscle cell. I have a difference in sodium concentration outside and inside. Sodium is really, really high outside. It's really low inside. Sodium begins to rush in. That causes an increase in sodium and an increase in voltage inside of the cell. That increase in voltage is just like turning on the switch. If I turn on this switch right now, I have a bunch of electrons right here, a bunch of charged particles that are waiting to go up there. And when I do that, the lights come on, right? And that's work being performed. That receptor is like the switch. And as I turn that switch on, there's a bunch of sodium that's waiting out here to flow into the cell. That movement from one location to the other is current. Current is what gives us the ability to do work. The work that we're going to perform is we're now going to move that sodium along the muscle, from the motor end plate out to the other parts of the muscle network. I got another picture I'm going to bring up here in just a second. So as the sodium rushes into the cell, it begins to move out away from the neuromuscular junction. So that charge begins to move away from the neuromuscular junction. So here's the neuromuscular junction. This is what we were just looking at. And you can see here this little uh, 
electrical signal there, I guess, a little bolt, is that charge that's moving along the membrane. It would move in both directions. Now, in the membrane of the muscle cell, we have these structures that dip well into, there's this, this invagination into the muscle cell. This structure here is called the transverse tubule, or the T-tubule. This T-tubule goes deep inside of the muscle. It interacts with a lot of the inner, internal things that we have inside of the muscle. So as this charge moves along the cell membrane, eventually we make it to a T-tubule or to a transverse tubule. And this, again, is just simply a tube that enters the cell. Now, I want to make sure that I really explain this well. This is not going directly into the muscle cell. We're not going inside of the muscle cell. We just have an extension of the extracellular fluid that's inside of the muscle cell. It would be kind of like taking a balloon and I stick my finger into the balloon. The rubber still separates my finger and keeps my finger outside of the balloon. I'm not in the actual balloon, but I'm very close now to being in the center of the balloon where I stick my finger in. Does that make sense? So this T-tubule is this extension, this inward extension where the extracellular fluid can permeate deep inside of the cell. And so our signal gets there and begins to follow that T-tubule down into the cell. So really this tube is just an extension from the membrane. And what that extension from the membrane allows is for the electrical charge to permeate deep inside of the cell. So it's not just up here at the surface, that electrical charge is having an effect down here inside of the cell as well. <coughs> now, that electrical charge, remember I said we're going to go from electrical charge to chemical charge to electrical charge to chemical, I'm sorry, um, electrical to chemical, electrical to chemical to mechanical in order to make a muscle contract. This electrical charge opens up channels. And these channels are protein. You can see a couple of them listed here. Basically, we have this series of proteins where this electrical charge interacts with these proteins that interact with a place in the cell called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is just a specialized form of the endoplasmic reticulum that we find inside of muscles. So the electrical charge is affecting the extracellular fluid, and it's affecting now the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Electrical charge opens up these channels. These channels are proteins. It's the electrical nature of that signal that causes the protein to open up. We're finding these proteins bound in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the SR. And those channels that open up they actually are going to be a calcium channel. Calcium is another ion with two positive charges. When those calcium channels open up, if I were to draw this out, so here would be my T-tubule, my signal comes down. If this is my SR here, so this is the SR. In the SR, I have a huge amount of calcium. Inside of the cell, I have a much smaller amount of calcium. Calcium begins to rush from the SR into the cell. I also have calcium that's high concentration here, low concentration here, begins to rush into the cell. Question? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Specialized form of the endoplasmic reticulum. In the case of muscle, just think about it as being a calcium storage site. Where we store calcium. So if I have high calcium here, high calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but low calcium normally in the muscle cell, and I open up channels that allow calcium to rush across the membrane, calcium is going to pour into the cell. So I get a high amount of calcium rushing into the cell, which is what's being shown here. 
So I go from a very low amount of calcium in the cell to massive quantities of calcium inside of the cell. Instantaneously. Remember the bracket, read that as concentration. So this is an increase in the concentration of calcium inside of the cell. So in the cell, we now have really, really high levels of calcium. Before this signal, we didn't have very high levels of calcium at all. In fact, we had very low levels of calcium in a resting muscle cell. Now, think back to the initial part of this lecture, and we were talking about actin and myosin, and how we prevented myosin from always grabbing onto actin, and I said there were regulatory proteins, right? So basically what you have to kind of think of here is if this is my actin and my myosin can grab onto it and pull on it, there's actually something that prevents the myosin from being able to grab onto the actin. That's the regulatory protein. That regulatory protein, in the presence of low calcium, stays in place. In the presence of high calcium, it actually moves out of the way. So now that I have high calcium levels inside of the cell, I've now created conditions where I can actually interact with myosin and actin. And as soon as I do that, as long as I have energy, ATP, muscle contraction occurs. So that high level of calcium that's just entered into the cell allows actin and myosin to interact. Now, this means that tug of war is going to begin. The model that we use to represent this tug of war is best described in this thing called the sliding filament mechanism. Sliding filament mechanism. This is what is kind of like the tug of war. All right, now we've really blown up myosin and actin. So here are my heads of my myosin molecule with the hinge, and so this molecule is what's going to go through that bending motion. The purple globs are my actin molecules. This stuff here is the; those are the proteins that restrict when myosin is going to be able to bind on to the actin. Okay? So I actually have to move these molecules out of the way in order for the myosin head to be able to interact with the actin so I can begin the type of war process. The sliding filament mechanism deals with <coughs> the myosin molecule pulling on the actin. And the two filaments, they slide juxtaposed to each other. So kind of think back to the sarcomere. So there's my actin molecules. Here are my myosin molecules. When they begin to slide, these filaments slide next to each other. So kind of in the next picture, if it were activated, It would look something like that because the filaments have sl slid. That's not really a word, but they've slid next to each other. So you have this sliding mechanism where the filaments slide juxtaposed next to each other to cause the shortening. And really, we are pretty familiar that the myosin is grabbing onto the actin and it's pulling on it to slide it against the myosin. It's clear as mud, right? We're going to finish it off on Wednesday. And we're going to kind of take the whole process and we'll talk about that molecular interaction that leads towards the myosin being able to bind up onto the active to cause the change in the sarc overall sarcomere. Now, in your mind, we're dealing with just one sarcomere. You got to put all of these sarcomeres kind of in one big long line. 
and they all shorten up just a little bit. And it would be kind of like having all of us get together, we hold hands, right? And everybody shortens up just a little bit. But at the very end of the line, that person will move probably a couple of feet, right? So if I move an inch, and the next person moves an inch, moves an inch all those inches get out together to hold the very last person. The muscle cell that's starting to move a small amount overall, the whole thing, moves a great deal. Okay. 